What do you think about BLM? Do you think it was a success or a failure? By spreading that idea, you create even more separation. They only report this stuff against white people. It's not like all white people are terrible by any means, but every other racial group had something that they were like seen as less and white people haven't really had that. Do you think the police have a racial bias against certain groups? I would be surprised if they didn't. Media can cover policemen very biased. I hate the system that is there. I know people who've gotten killed by the police. I'm like, I wish somebody would try me. <laughs> so today I'm out here and the question that I'll be asking is, is the media biased regarding racial violence? They only report this stuff against white people. They don't report all the stuff against other races. I think there's an increase of, an, of awareness and I think they're getting more and more coverage over police doing things that they shouldn't be doing. I think here in the US, the media doesn't really cover anything that doesn't gain any traction with a lot of the buzzwords like Black Lives Matter or Stop Asian Hate, etc. I work in media, so I know that there are biases based on, you know, who your advertisers are, who your audience is. Either, you know, they understand that there are racial issues in the world or they try and downplay those racial issues. I think that mainly, yeah, there is a bias. More coverage for the, like, the underdog, I don't know. The media perpetrates a lot of stereotypes regarding different races. When there's, like, the big mass shootings of the white people, it's always like, oh, he was mentally ill or he had this or that, like, some explanation. And for black people, it's just more point blank, this is how it was, it was their fault. Bias is... It's kind of hard to put a pinpoint on it, but I know it's not 100% equal, put it that way. Do you trust the media? Yes, I, I trust everyone, man, to a certain extent. I personally don't think the media is here to serve our needs. I work in media, and I'm telling you, they are there to sell. But that's why I don't watch, <laughs> ironically enough. Recently, there's been like platforms that have like independent fact checkers. Do you think that's a good move from these platforms to provide these fact checks? Or do you think in a way that's dictating what is considered fact versus opinion? Yeah, that seems like a lot more dangerous way to spread information because from an individual it's a lot more trustworthy nowadays. So today there's a noticeable shift in the perception that the media can't be trusted. The sources they're consuming are actively making them angrier and polarizing them. I will not tolerate fake news no more! Capitalism president. And in this environment where everything's polarized, people are longing for nuance but rarely get it. And so rather than cherry picking the data, we need to confront uncomfortable questions in order to uncover truth. And let curiosity discern whether racial violence is overrepresented or simply underreported. But can I really do so with my own biases and personal experiences? And more importantly, am I making the problem worse as someone who's creating media myself? And also, does exploring this topic put me at risk of my privacy and even my safety? Because when a single company controls 90% of your internet searches and tracks your every move, researchers a topic like this without any protection is like asking to get canceled without any opportunity for context. And since Big Tech uses your IP address as one of the ways to track you, I use ExpressVPN to mask it, making it more difficult to track me and exploit my data. And not only that, when I can finally take a break after spending hours on this damn video for y'all, I also use it to control what country my favorite streaming services thinks I'm in to decompress by accessing even more shows from over 90 countries. And as we stress on this channel, exploring the unfamiliar means that you always have a choice. And so if you don't like feeling powerless and you're tired of being influenced by big tech and media on what and how to think, get ExpressVPN now and get three extra months for free by using my link at expressvpn.com get. And with that, I guess we gon' see. How do you think like coverage of racial violence impacts societal relations? The BLM movement and the media really helped in the sense of awareness, but I think people can just make a statement or say something and feel like they've done their part in it. Post like a black square. Yeah, exactly, like the Blackout <laughs> Tuesday. That didn't do shit. I don't understand why anybody did that, but then it makes people feel better about it, and so I think it's like a double-edged sword. Sensationalizing division between races creates more division by promoting a victim mentality sometimes. It happens. People People genuinely hate other races like it's a terrible thing but by spreading that idea you create even more separation do you think like the media's coverage of racial violence helps solve racism or increases racial tension I think it's increased you know tomorrow turn, turn on the television people shooting up this person person shooting up here if it's not a lot of shooting there's a lot of drugs here now do you think media should be ignoring these types of incidents they shouldn't ignore it but there's some stuff we have control of some stuff we don't have control of if I'm gonna make a story about this now I wouldn't do it the way they be doing it what do you think is the media's motive to lie?
lie about instances of racial violence. I'm not sure they lie, they just don't report it accurately. When not all incidents are reported, relying on statistics is insufficient. So I thought it was important to hear other people's stories as well. Have you personally experienced any incidents of racially motivated attacks? I'm actually Mexican, but most people think I'm just white or Armenian, so like they tend to not like try to like act any way towards me because like they think I'm white. I'm from New York and I don't play that, so I'll, I'm always worried. I'm like, I wish somebody would try me. Well, no violence, but I heard people uh, shout the N-word to me. I just kind of look at it, hey, that's your choice to say what you want to say. It's my choice to listen to it. I just look at them and keep walking. I feel like this is a pretty rare mindset. How do you feel like you were able to kind of cultivate a mindset where it seems a bit impenetrable? I've seen a lot. I have done a lot. As I get older, I kind of look, hey, God got me on this plan for a reason. And one of the reasons not to hate. But are we being encouraged to lead with hate rather than focus on our similarities? Critical race theory views race as a social construct rather than a biological reality and argues that racism is not just about personal biases, but is deeply embedded in our systems to maintain racial hierarchies. So the idea was to get us to think systemically as opposed to just thinking that racism manifests by individuals just mistreating each other. While on the other side, critics argue that racism is a personal trait driven by individual bigots and that focusing on systemic issues diminishes individual agency and creates a vision between groups labeled as oppressed and oppressor. And the recent debate has led 44 states to propose bills to restrict discussions on racism in public schools. I don't want to teach kids to hate each other. And the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. But at the same time, are these critics suggesting that discussing racism is automatically considered racism itself? So it raises the question, does critical race theory promote victim mentality and hinder unity, or does it promote empathy and deeper understanding? But more importantly, what impact does the lens that we choose to view the world have on our perception of reality? So with that said, do you think most violence is racially motivated? I think racial and, and social and economic classes usually go kind of hand in hand. It's a big factor to a lot of things, and I think that stereotypes usually add into the fact that people are maybe going to have more fear in a certain situation based off of how someone presents. After Black Lives Matter happened, there was only news that I would see primarily about white cops against people of color, and there was never any instances otherwise of anything else. Black gangs do violence against their own members of their own race. White people, you know, if they're in a gang, they do violence against their own race. Why do you think media sometimes ignores instances like that? If we look at statistics, you know, probably the most violence against black victims is from black perpetrators. Why do you think that is not talked about in media? I don't know. <laughs> so when a story doesn't fit the narrative, will the media do whatever they can to change it? Every black person is gonna stand up! In August 2020, during the riots that followed Jacob Blake's shooting in Wisconsin, 17-year-old Kyle Rittenhouse shot and killed two people and injured another with an assault rifle. He ran up on somebody with an assault rifle, dude, with nothing. Like, he was just gonna tackle dude to the ground. Rittenhouse, who has previously expressed support for Blue Lives Matter but wasn't part of any right-wing militia, was then charged with multiple counts. And what followed was widespread media attention around the legal cases and conversations around gun laws, safety, and namely race. Did Kyle Rittenhouse act in fear of his own life and was that action reasonable? Although both the perpetrator and the victims in the altercation were all white, Joe Biden compared Rittenhouse to white supremacists and celebrities took to social media to pin extremist labels and even some wishing death. And on the other side, Rittenhouse was seen from traditional conservatives to extremist groups alike as a blameless individual representing ideals of law and order. You were trying to defend a used car lot. You had no other choice but to defend yourself. And in November 2021, despite murky evidence and arguments around the legitimacy of self-defense, we the jury find the defendant, Kyle H. Rittenhouse, not guilty. Rittenhouse was acquitted on all charges. So it raises the question, because when misinformation is a media concern, where should a line be drawn between investigating information and forming narratives before someone is proven guilty? And especially when media coverage and treatment is inconsistent, is it furthering the divide? And in January 19, an openly gay black man was attacked in Chicago by two white individuals who shouted racist and homophobic slurs, poured unknown chemical substances, and wrapped a rope around his neck. The incident immediately gained an outpouring of support for actor Josie Smollett, from Joe Biden to Bernie Sanders, and even an anti-lynching bill was sponsored in Congress. But as the investigation progressed, 
things were starting to not add up. The trove of evidence is all part of Smollett's elaborate hoax for publicity. After phone records and surveillance was examined, what they found was that not only were the two white guys actually two Nigerian brothers, but the whole incident was staged by Smollett in an attempt to further his career as he was dissatisfied with his salary. He did this all in the name of self promotion. And despite the conclusion of the trial, which resulted in a jail sentence of 150 days and a 145k fine, Smollett maintained his claim that he was a victim of hate crime and continued to receive support for his actions. And I'm innocent. I could have said that I was guilty a long time ago. And in any situation where lies are used to manufacture serious incidents like racial violence, it can't ever be excused. And when mugshots were used in media coverage of 45% of crime cases involving black people compared to only 8% for white people, it's undeniable that racial bias from both media and law enforcement still exist. But then again, has our thought process gotten to a point where we can't view anything other than the color of our skin? And if so, how does this impact the basic principles of society that rely on trust to exist? Do you think the police have a racial bias against certain group? I would be surprised if they didn't. A part of it is understandable if we're gonna be real. Look at who commits crimes, all of those things, right? But what's missing is the reason why people commit crimes. When your life is on the line, you need to be able to recognize where the danger is coming from. That may sound racist, I understand, but at the end of the day, it's statistics. If I know somebody is more likely to attack me, then why wouldn't I be more ready for that? What group do you think commits most crimes? I know that black people commit a lot of crimes. I know there are a lot of Mexicans and Latinos in jail. I know that white people also commit, I think people commit a lot of crimes. I don't know how many Asian people commit crimes. I would say it's probably less, honestly. You're just studying? Yeah, uh, no, you know, like... Media can cover policemen very biased. Do you get a few instances, but to like generalize all policemen as the same, I, I wouldn't do that. You know, a lot of people are saying like defunding the police is like a solution. I think we can already see the effects of defunding the police. There's more crime, there's more things that are happening. And I think that's what's caused most of the problems in Portland. Groups of people come breaking into, going into stores and just overwhelming the clerks and running off with thousands of dollars in merchandise because there's no police to handle that. And I don't think that has to do with race at all. I think it just has to do with the police not having enough funding to hire enough officers. I come from a neighborhood that's over police. I know people who've gotten killed by the police. You know, I don't hate all police. I hate the system that is there. When you look at the school, the city streets, the money can go to a different place. And I don't think that we need to fully defund the police because I think that the police does serve a purpose. Like, if we are paying for it, I need to see y'all everywhere. Wait, wait, but doesn't that conflict that you said that you no, want See I'm, I'm saying if we are paying for you. If the budget is getting increased, we, I need to see it. What do you think about BLM? It's like an organization. Do you think it was a success or a failure? For any political movement, like the Occupy movement, it failed because it didn't have a centralized message. So I think BLM was really successful in that sense. But because they had such an easy platform to work off of, I think that it became like a really performative thing. But I think there's more awareness generally than there was when like from talking to my mom from when my mom was a kid. So I think it's progress in that sense. Because for some racial groups historically, distrust of police is for valid reasons. But when public schools in Denver are showing students videos that claim police haven't trained to see people of color as criminals and instructing students to avoid the police, are we also teaching society to just start assuming that all police are racist? And with the impact of these movements and media's capitalizations of these certain narratives, are we furthering the divide by literally and figuratively only seeing black and white? Because from 2020 to 2021, there was nearly a 150% jump in a total of 11,000 anti Asian attacks, but did we really hear about it? Recently, there's been movements like Stop Asian Hate. And something that wasn't like maybe shown as much in the media, a lot of the perpetrators and incidents seem to be uh, African American individuals, but there seems to be a less coverage of that in the media. Why do you think Asians aren't really considered when it comes to racial violence? I don't know. I'm just white. <laughs> I don't know. I honestly like, I've heard about the Stop Asian Hate movement like a little bit. I really have not heard about it the movement at all that right. much. Maybe people kind of pick and choose the ra like movements that they want to rally behind yeah. instead of advocating for no, racial violence isn't good yeah. no matter who the group yeah. is. For a lot of people, it's like what you feel like you have a personal relationship mm. with, you know? And BLM feels like a personal thing for me. Right. And I think and I think that honestly probably is the deficit to humans is like, I feel like I have to have some personal connection to really feel like I want to get that involved. And as acknowledged, we all have biases based on personal experience that dictate the attention we pay on issues. But why is it that even in the media's climate 
bit of race baiting, anti-Asian attacks were not really talked about. Because when the anti-Asian attacks were at its peak, it seemed that for once, the media was doing everything to not mention the race of the perpetrator. But it wasn't just the media. Asian leaders were also silent. And it wasn't until our incident in March 2021 when the conversations surrounding racial violence against Asians actually became significant. A white man is in police custody accused of killing eight people at three spas in Cherokee. Robert Long, a white dude, was arrested after he opened fire at numerous massage parlors, killing eight people with six being Asian women. And immediately, media outlets, as well as Asian celebrities, began to tie the incident to anti-Asian hate, misogyny, and especially white supremacy. Another burst of violence that leaves Asians in America in anger and fear. The rising violence against Asian Americans needs to stop. Politicians like Biden and Kamala Harris also show support by criticizing Trump's rhetoric during the pandemic as the cause of these attacks. The Chinese virus, Kung flu. Once taken into custody, Long revealed to police that the attack was motivated not by race, but by sexual addiction that was at odds with his faith. Apparently has an issue, uh, what he considers a, a, a sex addiction, and sees these locations as temptation for him that he wanted to eliminate. And so the true motivations may never be known or relevant when innocent lives are lost. But does this raise questions whether the media genuinely cares about covering racial violence or prioritizing stories that fits the narrative to get clicks? And if the media is manipulating what we see, is it ultimately influencing how we think and how we perceive the world? Do you think talking about the race of the victims or perpetrators helps solve racism or create more division? I'm not scared of saying that someone's black or someone's Asian, right? Like it's a descriptor and it can go both ways. It can either make you sympathize with them or it can kind of give you an understanding of what might have caused the situation to happen. I think it's necessary, but at the same time, that shouldn't be the cause of why it's in the headline. And when fear comes into play, people become defensive. And when people become defensive, that's when you get these types of acts of people lashing out against each other. Do you think there's sometimes unequal coverages to not talk about certain races whenever they attack a certain race. The racial attacks that go against black people are obviously, I think, more covered because of America's history. For the most part, in the history of black versus white thing, we don't discuss when people in the Muslim community get killed or murdered or assaulted. It should matter more, but we don't because of issues that we've had with Muslims. From 9-11 hate crimes to Trump trying to implement a Muslim ban in 2016, Muslim hate has persisted in the states. And it's especially when we look at the issue globally, it becomes a apparent that there's a hierarchy of coverage around racial violence. Because let's say that allegedly there's a possible genocide going on, it seems obvious to me that we should probably all know about it. Uh, there's no so-called genocide or forced labor. The Uyghur Muslims are a minority group of 12 million living in Xinjiang, considered an autonomous zone in China. And it's estimated that around 3.5 million Uyghur Muslims are currently interned in prison camps that the Chinese government calls re-education centers. We set up the education and training center for those who have uh, conducted minor offenses of radical extremism. And despite their initial denial, leaked documents and satellite imagery have uncovered human rights violations from slavery, torture, and sterilizations. And so it begs the question, how is this not general knowledge? Nobody cares about what's happening to the Uyghurs, okay? You you bring it up because you really what? care, and I think what that's nice that you cares. care. The rest of us don't care. And the perfect lens to examine the reason behind the lack of awareness is the NBA. The NBA's significant presence in China has influenced its decision to avoid taking positions on sensitive issues to protect its business relationship. Analysts say anyone who accepts Chinese investment should be aware of China's sensitivities. In 2019, Daryl Morey, the former GM of the Houston Rockets, faced backlash from the Chinese government and businesses after expressing support for the pro-democracy protests in Hong Kong. And the consequences were immediate. This incident resulted in an estimated loss of 400 million dollars for the league. Yeah, we apologize. You know, we love China. We love you know playing there. But at the same time, is there hypocrisy behind the NBA's stance on social issues when considering their previous support of racial violence, police brutality, and LGBTQ plus issues? Free the Uyghurs, two million ethnic minorities in concentration camps. Something we got to talk about. You know, I'm always gonna talk about the real thing. Former NBA player Royce White describes the NBA's approach as Camille politics, criticizing both LeBron James and Nike for their hypocritical actions and selectively addressing social issues. He was given
given this billion know, dollars yeah. to keep his mouth shut about the single greatest humanitarian crisis of our generation. And so when media prioritizes certain narratives that are easier to convey, often results in overrepresentation of specific incidents, creating an incomplete picture of reality. So in our interconnected world, it's evident that there are additional factors and complexities to consider before labeling media as all liars. What would you think are like the media's motives for lying about racial violence? Media companies want to keep their advertisers. They may not know how to communicate what it is to their audience and kind of be brand safe. I mean, don't you think that's all news is in, in many ways, kind of talking about those issues like that? The purpose of the news is to report on the news. Like the truth, right? Ideally. I think the truth is always subjective in the news. It's definitely being played up, blown out of proportion in a lot of aspects. There will always be some sort of racial tension. It's just for views. I try not to feed into it because there's nothing good coming out of that. How do you get your news and information then? Look beyond just the stories because there's a lot of little anecdotes, but I take all of it with a grain of salt. I try to just not be as unbiased as possible with what I'm looking at. And as someone aspiring to build a media company, maybe I need to look at myself in the mirror and see that I'm not so innocent either. I gotta be self-aware too, right? Do you think this line of questioning is actually helping in the racial tensions or do you think this is actually adding to it? In general, I'm very much put everything out on the table. It's ignored, it's still just gonna be there and I think it'll come out in a lot of subconscious ways. Every culture, ethnicity, and race has its own issues. People should be comfortable to have these conversations. People are so divided. People need to stand up for making real change rather than just, I don't know, saying things for the sake of saying it. Because when media has the power to influence your perception, your world becomes binary as either the perpetrator or victim. And it's living in this polarized world where I need to continually remind myself not to compromise on my integrity and my values while I build towards my vision. But how do I do it? Do you think this line of questioning is furthering the racial tensions as well? I think what you're doing is you probably have questions and your audience likely has questions and you're the person who chooses to ask them. Because there's not much that can be done on what media will cover. But it's always up to us to have conversations with those we disagree with. And it's only then that we can stop looking at the world yeah. through black yeah. and white, literally and figuratively. But then again, why the hell should you listen to me? Because just maybe, Maybe you can actually start thinking for yourself for once. And with that said, thanks for watching and subscribe if you want to see more content where I turn street interviews into investigative journalism. And if you want to see more frequent uploads, check out my second channel, Gen Plus, the only reaction channel where we explore both sides. But hey, if you want to just binge more main channel videos, then fine, you'll like this video too.